Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, just one or two points uh, from, uh, from last time. Uh, we had a bit of a discussion, didn't we, uh, about when uh, halos first started to appear in Christian art. I suggested sort of late 4th, early 5th century, and that was basically uh, correct. Um, but I, 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 my authorities suggest that the very earliest halo uh, is on an ivory plaque of the Ascension of Christ, uh, dated about the year 400. Um, and if you want to see it, it's rather a nice one, if you tap in on your Google, uh, Dijon uh, Museum uh, and uh, Christ, uh, I, I, Ivory of Christ, you can, you can see it there. Um, it, the, the idea of halo on gods emerged first in uh, India and China. It's taken over by the Romans in Hellenistic times for uh, some of the gods, particularly the sun gods or associated with the sun like Son, uh, Sol or Apollo. Uh, and in the 4th uh, century, it was taken over by some of the Roman emperors. And as I say, um, by <coughs> the end of the 4th, early 5th century, uh, it had been appropriated by the Christian church and its Christian iconography. And you may perhaps remember uh, from last time my lecture on Jesus in art, uh, the fresco in a catacomb of a, of a bearded Jesus on, along the lines of Jupiter, that had a halo and that's dated in the 4th, early 5th century. Um, three ladies uh, quite properly pointed out to me last time that I made a mistake and I do apologise. Uh, in discussing uh, the pre-Raphaelites, and in particular Holman Hunt, whom I wanted to focus on, uh, I quite wrongly attributed uh, one of them to him when it was, of course, Millet, as three ladies quite properly pointed out to me. Uh, the one normally, normally were known as the carpenter's shop, uh, or the proper name is Christ in the house of his parents, uh, was in fact by Millet, not uh, Holman uh, Hunt. Um, and, and another slide that went in wrong last time on the early Christian ones, uh, one I described as Christ the teacher, more likely to be Christ with a Eucharistic meal or symbolic meal because it had two fish on. Uh, there is one not unlike that of Christ the teacher, uh, but that wasn't right. Um, what else did I want to say about last time? Oh, yes, we had a good discussion, uh, some of us afterwards, about Holman Hunt's Light of the World. And we were all quite right in thinking that the one in Keeble College, Oxford, was earlier than the one in St. Paul's Cathedral. What I hadn't realised, and I checked on the dates, is how much earlier it was. The one in Keeble College Chapel was painted in 1853, and the one, one in St. Paul's, not until 50 years later, in 1904. So that's, uh, that was really rather surprising. Now, before I show the uh, first image, um, Epiphany, on January the 6th, was the first, uh, was the, the major Christian festival in the midwinter, comparable uh, to Easter and, and, and Whitson. It was a very, very important feast. And the earliest mention of December the 25th as the birthday of Christ is as late as the year 336. But of course, as we know, December the 25th was eventually adopted as the uh, birthday of Christ. Uh, far, partly, of course, because uh, it was the birthday of, uh, the f or the feast, uh, of the temple in Rome dedicated to Sol Invictus, the invincible uh, son, who had become the chief deity for many Roman emperors at that time. And also, December the 17th was the beginning of the feast of Saturnus, uh, when there was great feasting, when presents were given, and when there was a reversal of roles. Slaves, slaves played their masters, and masters played their uh, their uh, slaves. Um, so it's not surprising uh, that when the Christian church became the official religion of the uh, Roman Empire in the 4th century, uh, they should, as it were, wanted to appropriate uh, or baptise uh, these two major win winter uh, festivals. So uh, now then to the uh, first, uh, first image. Uh, this is a uh, fun funeral uh, plaque to a woman called uh, Severa. You can see her name there, uh, dated to the year 330, uh, found in a catacomb under the streets of today, uh, today's Rome, in the catacomb of uh, Priscilla, and it's now in the Museum of Christian Art uh, in the Vatican. Uh, you notice that uh, Mary is sitting uh, on a basket seat, 
uh, and the three uh, magi or astrologers or wise men uh, are coming towards a dancing. I love that image. They're like sort of three fireflies. Joseph is pointing to a star and uh, Severa there uh, on one side, clearly in the dress uh, of a pretty well-off Roman uh, woman uh, with the Ro Roman inscription, Severa, uh, live in uh, God, uh, in Deo Vivas. Um, one of the interesting features uh, about uh, that is that this story uh, was probably based in part uh, upon an incredible narrative in the book of Numbers. Uh, the background is that the Israelites were invading the, invading the land of Canaan uh, and uh, uh, Balak, uh, the king of the Moabites, was terrified about this, so he got a seer called Balaam to go and prophesy against Israel. Balaam felt that God was telling him not to do it, Eventually he did set off, and you may perhaps remember the story. He set off, but the donkey on which he sat refused to go, and eventually the donkey started to talk to him and tell him that God had told him not to go. Well, anyway, to cut a long story short over Numbers 24-25, um, Balaam, instead of cursing uh, Israel, as he was ordered to by King Balak, actually blessed Israel. And in verse 17 of chapter 24, we read these words, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come forth out of Jacob. A comet will arise from uh, Israel. Uh, so there is the reference to the star. And the point is that these are seers or wise men or magicians coming to, as it were, to lay all their knowledge and wisdom as well as their gifts before Christ. Because I mentioned uh, last time that one of the ways in which the early Christians understood Christ was that all the uh, magical power of the ancient world had been broken uh, and had been brought to the feet of Christ. And that's these, these wise men or astrologers symbolize this uh, magic of the East being broken and brought to the feast, feet of Christ. And there is another uh, image which makes the same theme, theme, it's the fresco in the catacomb of St. Mark's and Marcellinian in the 4th century. You can see uh, there the, the three wise men, the Chaldeans, uh, in what are called their Phrygian uh, caps, uh, coming before the Christ child. Um, and in that catacomb there is a parallel fresco uh, of the boys in the far, burning fiery furnace, which of course to, again took place uh, in that uh, part of, of the world, making the point uh, that the, all this sort of magical wisdom uh, of the East uh, is now brought at the feast uh, at the feet of uh, Christ. Now, this is a very very unusual early depiction of the uh, of the scene. Uh, it comes from the Church of Saint Maria Maggiore. Uh, in Rome, dating from Mosaic from about the 5th century. Uh, uh, the Christ child is sitting uh, on a throne, Mary's on another throne beside him. Uh, it's not even certain that there are three kings there, two, certainly two kings you can see one side, I'm not quite sure which if any of the others are meant to be kings. This was a time when the iconography was still very, very open, but it is also uh, around about the time when there was a very major council of the church, the Council of Ephesus in the year 431, where Mary was given the title of Theotokos, bearer of God, which is better than the Western title, mother of God, bearer of God, uh, in order to emphasize uh, the fact that although she was fully human, she was giving birth uh, to a child who was the son, uh, son of God. Uh, this is in a church just near St. Maria, Maria Maggiore, Saint, Santa Prasade. Um, it's a, a, a later mosaic, uh, probably from the time of pa Pascal uh, in 822, who uh, re redesigned and rebuilt that church. What is interesting about this, and I'll be talking about in more detail about this later on, uh, of course, uh, is that those three figures uh, there um, are different ages. You can see... Uh, one uh, is young, one is middle-aged, and one with white hair is old. 
but you can see also at that time that Mary uh, has very much achieved the position of, a, of an empress <coughs> sitting on her throne. Uh, this is a 4th century sarcophagus. Again, you note the uh, Phrygian uh, caps of the three figures bringing their, uh, their gifts. Um, what you notice here is the, is the animals, and I'm going to say a little bit more about the animals later. Uh, the large star, uh, and which Joseph is pointing to it, and Mary uh, on a sort of basket seat, but rather looking away from the, the, the scene there. Now, there are two uh, standard types of showing the nativity in the early church. Uh, the first, uh, which is the, the, the adoration of the kings, a sideways uh, look uh, with Mary on a throne or a basket seat at one end and the three uh, magi lined up. This is the, the other way, a sort of full frontal scene. This is a pilgrim flask dating from the 6th century from uh, Palestine. Um, at the beginning of the, the, the fourth century, after Constantine had be, be taken over the emperor and become a Christian, uh, his mother, Helena, uh, made a pilgrimage to Jerusalem and discovered many of the sites associated with uh, Jesus. There is, by the way, a marvellous novel about Helena called simply that by Evelyn Waugh which has got some of its finest writing in, if you're interested in Evelyn War or uh, Helena. Um, uh, she was, uh, by uh, legend, a British girl, very keen on horses. Um, anyway, she discovered, she discovered the seat, uh, the, the places associated with Jesus. Now, and then pilgrims, therefore, started to make their way to Jerusalem. And pilgrims, pilgrims like tourists and everywhere, like to have a souvenir and what they took back with them uh, with, were these little ampullae, these little pilgrim flasks filled with holy blessed oil. And uh, many of these flasks ha did survive the period of iconoclasm. As, you, as I said, it's full frontal. It's kind of imperial imagery because Mary is in the front uh, with a, a, a big star above, a sign of, of divinity. Uh, and kings on one side and shepherds on the other. Now this is a Palestinian ivory from the 7th or the 8th century. Uh, ivory is one of the materials which managed to survive the period of iconoclasm that's from the 7th to the 9th uh, century. And we do have some wonderful ivories, particularly, of course, those of you who know in the in the V&A. Um, on, uh, 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 on the top half you can see uh, Mary sitting on her throne uh, where, with the uh, kings uh, and, uh, and an angel. And you see that the style there is less classical. Uh, it's more angular. And as I say, it comes from Palestine which isn't, wasn't sort of at that time sort of very firmly presumably uh, under, at least under the artistic control of Constantinople. Now the bottom half is particularly interesting. Um, I know it's quite difficult to see, and actually I don't seem to have got my little, uh, little thing here, but it doesn't matter. If you look at the bottom, uh, bottom half, you can see Christ uh, in a crib, looking a bit like an altar of sacrifice, um, Mary on her, her pallet, uh, the animals there, Joseph there, and there's a little figure uh, just below uh, the, the Christ child in that sort of little building, which is an altar, the altar of sacrifice. Um, and this is a figure who comes from an apocryphal gospel called the uh, Proto-Evangelium of James, basically dated from the second century. Uh, and in there is a story of Salome, who doubted whether... That Mary was a virgin and as a result her hand was withered uh, but then through touching the Christ child that hand was then healed again. And that's just a slight, a closer, I know the, I know the reproduction of that not very, very good 
uh, because it's been so enlarged. But just you can see, can just see the faint outline there of a figure reaching up her hand. Now this is a most wonderful church, which I mentioned uh, last time, St. Apollinari Nuovo, uh, with these fabulous 6th century uh, mosaics. A basilica-style building, which was the main style of early Christian architecture. Uh, a kind of church where the great processions took place. And on the mosaics on either side uh, of, the, of the nave are great processions. On one side, a procession of virgins, and on the other side, a procession of martyrs. And you can see all is green, which is the colour of paradise, as of course it is for Islam. Palm trees, again, symbolising paradise. Flowers symbolising uh, paradise and uh, the rebirth and the beauty. All is verdant and uh, beautiful. Uh, and it, you can see uh, towards the, the, the end, the, at the end of the procession, are three figures, then a couple of angels, and then Mary sitting on her throne. And there are the three figures. Absolutely wonderful. See the palm trees, the, the verdant pasture, the green, and the Phrygian caps. Uh, and you notice that they are different ages. You've got the young, the middle-aged, and the old. And I'll be saying a little bit more about that later. And they are bringing their gifts to Mary, very much uh, an empress, surrounding by her rather beautiful angels, the Christ child sitting on her lap. Now just going back to them, uh, the, the, the figures at the moment, let me say a little bit more. Of course, the, the, the story of the three Magi appears in St. Matthew's Gospel, only St. Matthew's Gospel, uh, they were probably Madzeans, which are Zoroastrian priests from Persia. But why were there three? Uh, there's no mention of three uh, wise men in the Bible, but it does mention three gifts, gold, frankincense and myrrh. So it's very natural to draw the conclusion uh, that there were three people, each one bearing a different gift. How about, how was it? that these three astrologers or wise men or seers became, in the course of Christian history, kings. Here at this point, in the 6th century, as I say, you can see that they're still basically the, uh, the, the, the wise men, even though they don't look very resplendent. Well, partly the influence of the Psalms and partly the influence of the book of Isaiah. Psalm 68, for example, says uh, that... Uh, because of the temple of Jerusalem shall kings bring presents unto thee. Uh, and they came uh, from all over the world. Psalm 72 says that they came from uh, Sheba and uh, Sala, for uh, example. They were actually called kings and given names uh, from as early as the uh, 3rd century. Uh, but this only came common from the, uh, the 6th century, um, and uh, in art they don't seem to be depicted in, till, uh, as kings until rather later than that and from the 9th century uh, they represented uh, not only the three different uh, ages or, or rather three, sorry, three different ages of man is represented earlier than that as you can see that but from the 9th century they were taken to represent uh, the three different races of humanity Africa, Asia and uh, Europe and we'll see later on, they later on came to depict one of the kings uh, as being uh, black. Um, there was a great uh, uh, cult uh, of uh, the three kings at Cologne. The, the relics of the three kings uh, were taken uh, from Constantinople via Mil Milan uh, to Cologne. And there there is an absolutely gorgeous uh, gold reliquary uh, in which uh, the relics of uh, the three kings, as they were thought of at that point, uh, were kept. Now, away from the three Magi, three kings, uh, to different aspects of the nativity story, uh, here is a Russian icon by a, a follower of, of Rubriev in the 14th century. Uh, it contains the standard iconography, uh, which had become pretty standard by the 11th century, 
standard then and standard uh, now. As you can see, it's a composite scene. Uh, in the, uh, these orthodox depictions, there'll always be a mountain, uh, and a mountain uh, with creation renewed. You can see little trees and little flowers spotting, uh, growing out of it. Note the size of Mary on the red palette. Uh, the size, of course, because size it, it reflects the importance in terms of orthodox uh, art. Uh, as it were, the bigger you are, the more important you are. Uh, red, because it's a, a royal palette. Um, why is she looking so exhausted? Probably to underlie the fact uh, that though that she was the Theotokos, the, the God-bearer, she was fully human and Christ was given a fully human birth and became a full human being, probably there to emphasize the humanity uh, of, of Christ. But as you can see, it's a composite scene. But now let us look at some of those details in it, not necessarily all from that icon, but uh, different icons. There you can see the angels uh, bending over uh, a, a crib, a crib which is looking strangely like an altar again uh, there. Um, why have we got a cave? There's no mention of the cave in the Bible. Yet from the second century, a tradition evolved that Christ was born in a cave. And if you go to Bethlehem today, as some of you have, uh, you are shown a cave. It may be because uh, Plato, the Greek philosopher, put forward a very, very famous uh, picture of us human beings living in a cave with a fire behind us and the fire showing th shadows on a blank wall. And what he suggests is in this life, all we see is shadows. We don't see the reality. Um, and it could be that the Christians adopted the image of the cave uh, in order to, to, to convey the fact uh, that Christ, the true philosopher, the true light of the world, has been born into the cave of our ignorance and darkness uh, in order to give us the truly real Now there are the midwives. No mention of the midwives in the Bible. Um, again, as I mentioned already, it comes from the Proto-Evangelium of, of James uh, and as I've already mentioned, their function was to ensure that uh, uh, Mary was uh, indeed a virgin, uh, Virgo intacta. Uh, but uh, here, they, of course, they're simply washing the babe. And here is a very dramatic example of the Christians taking over lock, stock and barrel uh, pagan uh, imagery. Because if you go to uh, Paphos uh, in Cyprus, for example, or to Beirut, there you will find mosaics of the birth of Dionysius. Uh, and the picture of the birth of Dionysius uh, has two maid midwives uh, bathing him uh, in exactly the same way as you see here uh, the bathing of Christ. And here is Joseph being tempted by an old shepherd in that amazing, amazing coat. <laughs> I love that coat. Uh, in some depictions, uh, Joseph, uh, the shepherd, uh, is shown uh, with horns because, of course, he is there tempting Joseph uh, not to, to, to not really believe uh, that Mary's child is indeed the Son of God. Now, if you go into the standard Greek church, which, as I mentioned before, achieved its sort of uh, 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 its final kind of definitive form in about the 11th century, the cross in square, the architectural device for putting a dome on the square uh, included at the corners what are called squinches, and each of the four squinches uh, has on it either a fresco or a mosaic of one of the major scenes. Uh, in the life of Christ. And this, of course, uh, is uh, another depiction of uh, the birth of Christ with all those incidents in it that I have mentioned, uh, the angels, the appearance to the shepherds, the coming of the kings, uh, the animals, the midwives, Joseph, uh, and so on. This is uh, from a lovely church uh, called o the Church of Osios Lucos in Greece, uh, just above the, the Bay of Corinth, dating from about 1020. And here's a similar one, also from Greece, from Daphne, just a little bit later, from about the year 1100. 
Uh, again, in both of them, uh, you see the great rays coming down from the star to shine on the Christ child, in, uh, again in his crib, which is very much like an altar. This is one of my very, very favorites. Uh, this is from uh, Cyprus. Um, if you go to Cyprus and get away from all the tourist resorts and go out in the mountains, the Troodos Mountains, there are most wonderful, wonderful churches there. Nothing to look at from the outside. They're hidden away with great sloping roofs uh, and they're not very big, but you go inside and there's a kind of heaven inside. Uh, and this one, which has been well restored and looked after by UNESCO, uh, is the Church of Ligudera, completed in 1192, called the Church of Panhagia to Araku, uh, the Church of the Pea. Uh, like so many Appalachians, the Virgin uh, comes from a plant or a vegetables. Uh, and what is uh, also interesting uh, about this um, is uh, that uh, it represents one of the high marks of classical revivals uh, in the Byzantine tradition. Basically, there were three classical rev revivals uh, in Byzantine art under the Macedonian, Comnenian and Paleologian emperors. First of all in the 9th century, then in, in the 11th, 12th century and then in, finally in the 14th century. This dates from the middle period, the Comnenian uh, period from the 9th to the 12th century. Note those classical features. Look at that beautiful midwife at the bottom. Look at that handsome shepherd. And at the top, Look at that exquisite angel. Okay. Look at that. Isn't that? I showed that last time. I can't resist showing it again. Wonderful, wonderful classical angel. Uh, then uh, there is Joseph being consoled by a donkey. Uh, the crib uh, there uh, as an, very much an altar. Um, and uh, Mary, uh, very dominant here on a white pallet. And it's all wonderfully, wonderfully, uh, I think, uh, aesthetically uh, pleasing. Now this is interesting because uh, this is from Sicily, uh, from around the sort of same sort of period, the 12th century, from Palermo. But what was happening in Sicily is that there was a uh, an interaction uh, of East and West because, of course, the Normans went to Sicily. And here you've got the traditional Eastern iconography that we've been talking about, uh, the midwives and the crib and uh, as an altar and so on. But, of course, you can see something different about, about the style, can't you? It's a much more Western style. You've still got some classical features, but the, the sort of faces seem fuller or rounder. Uh, the, the, it it's definitely uh, has, a, has a slightly more Western feel, even though you've got the Eastern iconography. But what was happening in the West? We've been talking about the East, except as far as going to Sicily, which where you had the fusion of the East. And what was happening in the West? Well, ah, sorry, I'm just going to show, show, before we come to the West, just a quick glance of a Russian icon that I'm very fa fond of. Not quite sure of the date, but I think it might be 14th century, where you have this wonderful blue uh, mandola there. So we're coming to the West. This is what's known as the Frank's casket, dates from the 11th century, made of whalebone, uh, and on it is a, a, a riddle, uh, which reads, The fish beat up the seas onto the mountainous cliff, the king of terror became sad when he swam onto the shingle. So this was obviously a beached whale and people who read that had to guess that it was made from whalebone uh, and of course whales were a reminder of uh, the story of Jonah which was taken as a symbol of the death and resurrection of Christ. And you can see there uh, on, the, uh, on one, one of the halves uh, the three uh, uh, kings there uh, bringing their presence uh, to Mary who's, fa who's facing you frontally on her throne with a huge star above. And there is a close-up. I know the definition is not very good there, but that's as good as we could do. You can see this in the British Museum. <coughs> uh, 
Now I said I'd say something about the animals. This is from uh, the Winchester Bible. I mentioned in my very first uh, lecture that of course the tradition of illuminating uh, the Bible uh, developed from the 5th and 6th century it was particularly strong of course in the West this is the Winchester Bible from the 13th century now as we've seen from some of these images I've already shown you uh, animals appear from about the 4th century why animals? there's no mention of them in the Bible <laughs> well there's a kind of hidden allusion to Isaiah chapter 1 verse 3 uh, there uh, we read, the ox knows its owner and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know, my people do not understand. And this verse, Isaiah 3, was referred to by commentators from the second century and it's probably in the mind of Luke who three times refers to the crib. Now the shepherds uh, are a sign that this verse has been repealed some of God's people do recognize their owner. Uh, but later on, uh, this particular verse developed an anti-Jewish note. Uh, the ox and the ass recognized their owner, but the Jews did, did not. So certainly by, by this time, the, the presence of the animals there would immediately have brought to in mind, and the, the preachers no doubt went on about it, would have brought together Isaiah 3, and the lesson would have been, even the ox and the ass recognized that Christ was their saviour, but Jews uh, did not. And just another example of the very unfortunate and destructive anti-Judaic teaching that uh, so many in the church have indulged in over the, over the years. Now this scene of the crib became very, very popular from the 13th century because St. Francis had a crib at his midnight mass at Christmas on 1223 and this caught on became very popular and it was also associated, associated with the new very very intense Franciscan piety uh, all Christians not just priests but lay people were encouraged to imagine that they were there to imagine that they were there almost holding the Christ child And here is, a, is a, a, another uh, example of art from the West, from Chartres Cathedral, uh, a, char a, 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 a carving on the, on the rood screen there, uh, Joseph uh, with, a, with a blanket and the animals either side, keeping the Christ child warm. This is another legend that uh, developed from uh, Ludolf of Taxon, Saxony and his book on the life of Christ. He, the, he, the writer claimed to see, quotes, how the ox and the ass kneeling down put their mouths to the crib breathing through their noses onto the Christ child because they knew at that cold time he needed to be heated up in this manner. So very, very caring animals looking after Christ. So if you're feeling cold you can, at home you can think about, uh, about that. So the animals you know, became part of this sort of popular developing uh, theme uh, of, uh, of, of a humanized sort of uh, nativity. Uh, here's another uh, carving which I'm fond of, I, I think uh, from Chartres, but I can't, uh, my memory is not quite certain there, but it, the reason I'm showing, because it's become human and animated. The Christ child is delighted, Mary is smiling, the kings are enjoying themselves and the angel is looking extremely interested. Now this is a very, very great carving. We do know all about this one. Uh, this is uh, from uh, Autun uh, in France uh, and it was carved by the one person from that period whose name we know on these carvings, uh, Giselbertus. Giselbertus uh, carved this. Uh, this is the angel coming to the three kings in a dream. The lovely one. Now this tradition of northern European carving uh, began to influence uh, Italy um, and we have some very interesting early Renaissance carving of the nativity. This is a nativity scene on the pulpit in the baptistry of Pisa Cathedral 
carved by uh, Nicola Pisano, uh, the Pisanos, uh, Father Nicola and the son Giovanni in the 13th and early 14th century, uh, were hugely influential at that uh, period. Now what's interesting about this, the reason I'm showing it, you have a traditional scene here of course, but of course uh, the, the style uh, is very Roman rather than Byzantine. Um, Mary could have come from a Roman statue of a matron there. And the, all the figures uh, are very, very different from the kind of ones we've seen before. But a very, very fine, uh, very, very fine carving, traditional imagery, but a very, very different uh, style. And again, there's another uh, one on the same pulpit of the Three Kings uh, kneeling. Again, I'm afraid the definition isn't brilliant, but it's the best I can do. Now, those of you who know uh, Padua will, of course, know the Scrovegni Chapel, which was de totally decorated by Giotto uh, in the uh, early 14th century. And there we have uh, the scene, two scenes of the Nativity. Uh, this is one where Joseph where we have just Joseph and the sheep and there we have the three kings and the camel. Dante in his great poem said, Cimabue thought he held the field in painting and now Giotto is the cry, the other's fame is obscured. Giotto usually thought of as the uh, beginning of the uh, Renaissance. Um, I love uh, Giotto personally, as I think probably many uh, of you do, um, but um, uh, I don't think it's necessary uh, in loving him uh, to denigrate the Byzantine art which came before him. The very, very influential art historian Vasari, writing whatever it was, 150 years after that, wrote this about Giotto. Not only did the young boy equal the style of his master, but he became such an imitator of nature that he completely banished the crude Greek style and revived the modern and excellent art of painting, introducing good drawing from live natural models, something which hadn't been done for more than 200 years. So what we have to remember is that Byzantine art dominated Italy at that time, but I think that Vasari was totally wrong in describing Byzantine art as crude. It is a sophisticated art which follows certain spiritual conventions. And I think one of the reasons why Giotto is so wonderful from a religious point of view, that he does retain a Byzantine sense of devotion and reverence, was combining it uh, with more naturalism and a greater humanism. My own feeling is that by the High Renaissance, uh, whatever the glories of the paintings in terms of, of technique and colour and so on, a dra drama, a movement, something of what you might call this numinous dimension has been lost. But anyway, that's, uh, that's my own feeling about it. I personally love this early Renaissance and whilst I admire, I don't feel quite so strongly from a religious point of view about the High Renaissance. But before we look at the High Renaissance in Italy, just let's look at the High Renaissance in Northern Europe because the High Renaissance in Europe, Northern Europe also retains something uh, of this, this quality of real, real devotion. Um, this is by Rogier van der Weyden who lived in the 15th century. It's the uh, Bladerlin altar in Berlin. And this is interesting because the Bridget of Sweden had a vision of the Nativity while she was in the church in Bethlehem and she wrote about it in her revelations and these were widely known by 1400 and influenced northern artists. And Mary is shown as a result of that vision taking off her blue mantle and shawl, kneeling on the ground in her white tunic adoring the naked Christ. And he lies on the ground emitting light, uh, the luminous child outshines uh, the light of, uh, of Joseph's lantern in many pictures. Uh, yes, you can just see tiny light of Joseph's candle there. Uh, but, and also, there were other very, very, very influential devotional texts at the time. Uh, one called the Meditationes Vitae Christi, an early Franciscan meditation. 
uh, says that the Son of God, then the Son of God came out of the womb of the mother without a murmur or a lesion, in a moment. As he had been in the womb, so he was now outside on the hay at his mother's feet. So in these pictures of this time, you see the child down there, Mary kneeling, uh, looking down uh, and uh, uh, adoring. And um, here is a, 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 a similar painting with a similar spirit of devotion uh, by Hugo van der Gross, again from the uh, 15th century. He was Flemish. Uh, he entered a monastery uh, and you can see that great sense of a spiritual devotion in him. A few years ago I was asked by the National Gallery to select my uh, favourite uh, painting in it for one of their monthly booklets and I chose this one. It's The Nativity at Night by Gertgen Tot St. Jeans, uh, dated from 1490. He was a lay brother in the Order of St. John in Harlem and there's this wonderful sense of stillness and quiet devotion and solemn, solemn reverence. Uh, and as in the other pictures, but particularly so here, that all the light is coming from the Christ child lighting up Mary's face, lighting up the little angels looking down, or shepherds even lighting up the angel in the sky. Now when we come to the 17th century, we get quite a significant change because the, uh, the prominence given, almost total prominence given to the three kings as they were then, uh, then began to be displaced by the shepherds. And here we have Rembrandt's nativity from the 17th century, a dark cavernous stable with the family huddled around the light uh, uh, of Christ. And it's only at this time that the shepherds rarely get depicted in their own right. And of course this particularly appealed to Rembrandt, whom if you know, remember, began by painting huge grandiose scenes and then as a result of a series of personal tragedies, deaths in his family and bankruptcy, began to paint with a huge sense of pity for ordinary suffering mortals. And here you have an ordinary working class scene, a working stable, ropes and ladders, uh, ordinary faces of shepherds, chatting, uh, chatting, a boy with a dog, uh, not the traditional ox and ass, but a cow. This, to quote George Herbert, is as it were, heaven in ordinary. And here you have the kind of uh, scene which began to take over in the 17th century by Gerrit van Honthorst, um, the adoration of the shepherds, is a Dutch painter, a biblical and Jean scene, and as you can guess, much influenced by part of his life by Caravaggio and the use of uh, chiaroscuro or alternative dark and uh, light. Now, I think I mentioned in a previous lecture uh, that from about 1300 to 1450, art ceased to be a purely public affair and became uh, taken inside houses. Uh, to be used in acts of personal devotion. First of all, small portable icons or triptychs, but of course with the advent of printing, this art for personal devotion was much more widely available. Here is a print of the adoration which would have been used for private uh, devotion. This was perhaps from a, uh, a, bi uh, a biblical uh, Bible. Now, when we come to the High Renaissance in Italy, uh, we do get something very, very different, don't we? Uh, this is Gazzoli, the procession of the kings to Bethlehem uh, on the walls of the, uh, on wall in the Medici Palace in Florence, date and uh, painted in 1459 to 60, shown as a, uh, an opportunity to show famous, the famous people of the time, including the Byzantines who came for the Council of Florence in 1438. It's all luxury, ostentation, coming to worship, but there seems to be some emphasis upon the luxury and the ostentation. Not a very good uh, uh, definition, I'm afraid, but you can see uh, that uh, camel trail and the horse trail winding its way up the, up the hill there. Uh, but there's the better definition. Uh, it's all, all splendor. This is interesting because it's another example of the meeting of East and West. When uh, Constantinople fell, 
uh, a school of Aiton painters went to Crete. It was from there that I mentioned it last, last time, if you remember, that El Greco came. He was originally an Aiton painter. This is by Damaskinos uh, from the 16th century. And what's interesting about it is that you have got uh, much of traditional Eastern iconography, but of course you've also got some of the influence of the Italian High Renaissance because you've got an emphasis there upon a great procession. The mountain is there from the East Eastern art, uh, but uh, you, you've certainly got an emphasis upon all life and colour and splendour of the procession. This, of course, people will know. Um, it's uh, Piero della Francesca. Um, it, it's got something of the northern spirit of devotion on it, hasn't it? You can see Christ on the ground, Mary kneeling, um, the angels there, uh, and singers, perhaps influenced by Luca della Robbia. Now, very, very often in uh, Christian art, uh, particularly in the Middle Ages, uh, the stable is shown in ruins, and perhaps sometimes the whole town in ruins, indicating a ruined Judaism and a ruined classical world, because the new birth of Christ was coming, uh, bringing the new order and the new uh, creation. This is Mantegna, uh, the adoration of the Magi. Uh, and the reason I'm showing this, I think it's a wonderful, wonderful picture, uh, is simply that you can see clearly that uh, one of the three kings is black. They're young, old, and middle-aged, and one of them is black. There were hints of one of the ones being kings being black earlier, but the fact that 30 Ethiopian ambassadors went to Roman Avignon in 1306 very much brought the idea of, of skin colour to the fore and they were there also at the Council of Florence in 1439. So the idea of one of the kings being black began to take hold in Europe, first of all in Germany and then in Italy uh, and in particular with Mantegna uh, in this wonderful depiction of the three kings in close-up. Now this is a most interesting picture which one could talk about for about an hour but I'm afraid we're beginning to run out of time, so I'm going to have to not do all, the want, uh, all that I want on it. Uh, you can see this, of course, in the National Gallery, Sandro Botticelli, uh, who lived from 1447 to 1515. Now, Florence at that time was in turmoil. Uh, first of all, it had been invaded by, uh, by France, but perhaps even less, uh, less important than that was that the uh, revivalist preacher Savranola was busy, busy stirring people up. And people believed that the end of the world was near. From time to time, throughout history, Christians have believed that the end of the world was near. And they believed that around 1500 or 1503, the world would come to an end. And Savranola uh, had his, his, his followers uh, going around um, uh, Florence, uh, confronting women with jewels, telling them to uh, throw all their jewels away. Um, and um, some of, uh, clearly, uh, some of uh, Botticelli's family uh, were followers of, of Savonarola. They were known as Pionioni, or whiners. Uh, and this painting, like some of his other paintings, reflects something of uh, this sort of sense of, of, of a new order uh, coming. Uh, there are angels dancing at the top. Uh, there are angels at the bottom embracing human beings uh, and the text on the top does indicate quite uh, clearly uh, that uh, the end of the world is about to happen very, very, very soon. This is known as the mystic nativity. It may also have been influenced by Plato as well as uh, Savranola. But this is heaven and earth embracing uh, in the, as, a, as it were as a as a prelude or an anticipation of the new order of things which was coming uh, into being. There you can see the angels dancing and there you can see them embracing human beings. Now a very quick uh, scurry through uh, some of the later art. Uh, Burne Jones tapestry which you can see in the museum in uh, Norwich. Um, Tapestry has also been a, a favourite medium for Christians. Many have survived from Coptic Egypt in the 5th century, many medieval ones, and as you know, 
uh, the Gothic revival in the 19th century and the pre-Raphaelites wanted to revive all things medieval. So this has a medieval feel about it. Uh, Eric Gill, whom I mentioned last time, uh, wonderful letterer, A modern artist, I'm just going to show you that a few fairly quickly because um, just to indicate that the traditional depicting the nativity is still, it, still very much alive and well. This is Mark Cazalet, born 1944, The Three Kings. Christ with his arms outstretched there, clearly indicating the manner of his death. Nicholas Mine here, very, very characteristic style of his. Beryl Cork, who died in 2008, one of Britain's most popular artists. You always get these large, cheerful, self-confident women, although <laughs> she herself was rather shy. She lived in Plymouth all her life. She had no formal training, and she didn't start painting till middle age. There's hope for all of us. She was influenced by Stanley Spencer, I think you can see that, and Edmund Burrough. And Victoria Wood has the wonderful description of her as Rubens with jokes. <laughs> It's all a bit like a child's farm set, isn't it? Full of exuberant delight. Just one indication that, of course, we, that, that there's a huge amount of world art, not just European art, which, if we had time, we would deal with. This is Yasuo Ueno uh, from Japan, born 1926. Multitude of the Heavenly Host. Angels, of course, play a major role uh, in the nativity scene. Mentioned last time, no, I haven't mentioned last time, but, but one of the, for many people, the, the, the best of the modern religious painters is Norman Adams, particularly his Stations of the Cross in Manchester. This is his nativity, not his greatest painting, but I just thought I'd give you an example of it. Characteristic Norman Adams style. And a lovely one I'm very fond of by Albert Herbert, who died in 2008, Nativity with the Burning Bush. Albert Herbert gave up representational painting because he felt he'd come to an end. Then he tried abstract, felt that wasn't really working either. He found his way to a new sort of dreamlike style uh, with, with, with this sort of deliberate sort of naive uh, style, very evocative religiously. Uh, you've got the burning bush there uh, indicating the presence of God and Mary holding the Christ child to a kneeling old man who's as it were old and wise willing to receive the wisdom of the Christ child and my last one um, this is John, John Piper well known as a painter of churches and does some wonderful stained glass this is one of his stained glass pieces in St. Uh, St. Mary's Church uh, Ifley uh, there's a very ancient tradition that uh, on Christmas day all the animals became articulate uh, and there was a mass in which choristers took the parts of the different animals. And in the 4th century, Prudentius wrote a poem on this film, and in the 17th century, there's a carol based on it. The carol has the words which are contained in this um, stained glass of John Piper. The cock croweth, Christus natus es, Christ is born. The raven asked, quando, when? The crow replied, hop not te, this night. The ox cried, ubi, ubi, where, where? The sheep bleated out, Bethlehem, Bethlehem. A voice from heaven sounded, Gloria in excelsis, glory be on high, whilst armies of angels sang, Alleluia, salutation and glory and honour and power be to the Lord our God. And all those words actually are contained uh, in there on, on the branches. It's a wonderfully, uh, wonderful piece of, of stained glass, and you, as you can imagine, which does give something of the joy of whole, all creation uh, at the birth of the Christ child. And I think there, ladies and gentlemen, we must sadly stop because it would be fun to go on for much longer. Um, and um, thank you very much. If you spot any... Uh, I've done the notes differently this time. I thought it would be easier for people to have all the notes at the back. There are a few typos and one or two mistakes I've already seen, particularly on the pre raphaelites But if you can see anything wrong next time, I'll engage in some conversation with you. Uh, otherwise, uh, have many blessings for Christmas and uh, hope to see you... Uh, in the new year and beginning of uh, January for the next lecture.